Welcome back to another Provident webinar. I'm your host, Ed Mann, Director of Training and Education for Provident. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Tom Lewis, Director of Enterprise Training for First Do. Tom will formally introduce himself in a few minutes. Tom and I met several years ago when I served as a Pennsylvania State Fire Commissioner, and he was working for emergency reporting. We have both moved on to other positions with other employers. I can personally tell you he knows the importance of accurate data. I often hear people in the fire service complain that law enforcement always seems to be better funded than fire departments at all levels of government. I believe much of this is because law enforcement has much better data at all levels of government. I know accurate I know accurate data collection is a priority for Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, our United States Fire Administrator. And if it's not a priority for you and your department, it should become one of your priorities. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions and we're asking you to use the question and answer feature to send your questions. We'll make every effort to answer all of them. However, if we don't get to your specific question, we'll get answers to you via email in the, following, in the days following the webinar. Before we begin with Tom, I need to cover, obviously introduce you folks, especially new folks, to what Provident is. Provident Insurance Programs got its start in 1902 as an independent insurance agency in Allegheny County near the city of Pittsburgh. In 1928, the owners of the company realized that many volunteer fire departments in Western PA and volunteer firefighters had no insurance to cover them if they got hurt while they were doing volunteer work. And as such, they started an accident and health program and offered accident and health insurance policies. Today, we provide volunteer combination and career firefighters and emergency medical responders with a multitude of insurance programs. We also offer special risk and transportation insurance. Provident has been voted uh, named one of the top insurance places by the Insurance Business of America magazine for the last four consecutive years. Some of the programs that we have, we have an accident health insurance program. Uh, and if you are an accident health client, yourself and your immediate family have the ability at no charge to use our first responder assistance program. We also offer a 24-hour accidental death and dismemberment insurance policy, which would provide protection to your members 24 hours a day on or off duty uh, if they were to die from an accidental death. Uh, we also offer group term life. We have a critical illness and cancer policy. And we also, of course, have our Fire Plus property and casualty insurance program. And if you're one of our property and casualty clients, you and your members would have free access to our Fire Plus Training Academy, which offers, offers well over 400 online courses. And all of the full length EMS courses are approved by CAPSI for continuing education. So tonight, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce what I'll refer to as an old friend of mine, Tom Lewis. Ed, thank you so much, um, Ed and Sam. Um, it's a privilege to be here tonight. Um, you know, I think the world of you, Ed, um, from your time doing the Courage to Be Safe video we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, that was when I first got to meet you, at least remotely here from Arizona, and then connecting uh, later in my fire service career to meet you um, in person um, during uh, my, my previous uh, RMS uh, company that I work for, and now here at First Do. It's just it's great to re always reconnect with you. So thank you very much for having me here today. And I like the topic we came up with today. Can firefighters and software be friends, right? Because I'll tell you, you, you said it right. And why, why does law enforcement, why does law enforcement seem to get more of the funding? Well, one of the things I had heard was that at the, in their academies, the written word becomes very important. Everything they write is almost a legal document. They contact with the citizen in the street. They've got to document almost everything that they do. In the fire service, not so much. Writing, doing good emperor's reports, doing good EPCRs, documenting your day-to-day -day routine, the emphasis on that. I don't know of too many academies, I know mine certainly didn't, where you get that technical writing skill to be effective in, in managing your day. It comes while you're on the job, and certainly as you choose to promote, you, it becomes more and more part of your daily routine. But I often wonder if we made it more of an emphasis at the beginning 
that we would do overall better and understand the value of data um, in the fire service better. But we're getting there, right? Uh, we, we're getting there. Uh, Chief, Chief Brunacini, Alan Brunacini, which I think most listeners will remember, he was, uh, I was privileged to have him present. Um, I was a privilege to have him present in, at a, a company event. And he talked about how data drives the fire service, but it's humans in the driver's seat, and that you've got software, hardware, and liveware, which are the humans, and they come to form the fire service data triangle. You know, we know kind of the old school fire triangle, right? Fuel, oxygen, and heat. And of course, we know it's more complex than that, than the whole process of burning. But, you know, that was always introduced to us early in our fire service training. And so I thought that was a pretty pretty awesome um, way to look at it. And you take away any one of those sides, your data is not going to be good. You don't have good software, you're going to struggle. If you don't have the hardware to support it, you're going to struggle. And most of all, if you don't have the buy-in from the troops and then the leadership at the top on explaining the why behind it, because that's a lot of what leaders do when it comes to this part of our job, right? Many, mm, certainly not most, but many are passionate about the technology in the fire service. But most, most of us didn't get into this, you know, to be on the computer all day, right, to do that. And so how do we make that, if not enjoyable, at least tolerable, and that they understand what they're doing is indeed valuable, that it matters. If you do a high quality ENFRS report downstream, that's going to tell your story for your community, what your department is doing for your community. Ronnie Coleman also spoke at a regional training academy we had done years ago, and he talked about justify and verify, right? You, you've got to be able to justify your existence and then verify it with the data that's being produced from your organization. And it's from every, there's how many data points are we collecting day in and day out on, our, on, on the job from vehicle checks to incident reports, to documenting your training, to doing pre-plans. There's so much we're collecting. How well are we using that to enhance our mission? And that mission, that's the key to never lose sight of is we're here to keep the Keep the troops safe, keep keep the crews safe, first and foremost, so they can take care of Mrs. Smith, and then they keep our civilians safe. So one of the things we did a study here at First Do, and um, you know, I'm not going to bombard the, the listeners with just so many notes before, you know, so many numbers before we get into the system, but it's interesting that the surveys that we sent out to dozens of um, fire service leaders is that chiefs, leaders of organizations are saying that 62% of them are saying that. Their pre-planned process is either unusable or difficult, okay? Six, two thirds almost. And then 65% were just plain unhappy with the process because pre-plans, right? One in 20 departments have no pre-plans. Thankfully, that's a pretty small number, but yet one in 20 still don't have pre-plans. And then 95% of departments don't even have any residential pre-plans. Now, is that critical throughout a jurisdiction? Not necessarily, but with something that first two has to offer, with Community Connect, you can at least know that maybe someone's mom who is an invalid is living with them or needs a little extra care if you're going to respond there or watch out for the pet. Um, you know, make sure you don't forget the pet or that the pet is aggressive. They can put that in, in our Community Connect. So at least you have some actionable intel to keep yourself safe when you're responding to a residential structure. But 95% have no, no pre-plans for residential structures. Um, Tom, you're going to be able to show the, the, the listeners the community connect that you're talking about, correct? 100%. We're okay. Going to that. So, so I want to back up just a second. Yeah, so you yeah. talked about the importance of the data for the fire department, but let's take that beyond there. So when I worked at the state, we eventually got to a point where a large number of Pennsylvania fire departments were finally reporting to the state because of the requirements in the grant. Right. So now the data, the state has data that they can use when they have to go before the General Assembly to make a point that, hey, we need more money in the grant program or this. These are the trends we're seeing with staffing. And, and, and then you take it one step further and it goes to the federal government because it's all being uploaded to ENFERS, to, to, to the U.S. Fire Administration. That gives them a tool to be able to use to negotiate with members of Congress to try to get us additional funding. And, and that's where law enforcement, I mean, that's, look, a lot of the money that goes to law enforcement comes from the federal government. And it comes from the federal government because they have data to support 
what they do. Well, 100%, right? And you're if you can't tell your story to the decision makers, they're not going to listen. Yep, yeah, everybody loves a firefighter, but the days are gone where they're just going to throw things, if those days even existed, where they just throw things at us because we're the good guys, right? Now we're competing for those scarce resources, and we've got to be able to tell that story effectively and accurately um, to secure those funds, right? The AFG program has been a pretty successful program. I mean, back when it first started in the early 2000s, I remember writing some successful grants for my department and a volunteer department nearby. And it be, it's kind of become a model grant program. So that's a, that's a big plus in the right direction when it comes to the, the data that is being used for awarding grants, right? You, you just don't get to write a, a few paragraphs. You, there's a lot that you have to do to be able to secure those grants. And I'm sure it's the same in the state of Pennsylvania and other states where there's local grants. I know Arizona has Arizona, Go Arizona Governor's Office of Highway Safety, where you can get um, roadway incident uh, equipment, you know, extrication equipment, things like that that are specific to roadways. But you've got to you've got to justify it. You've got to have the tools to be able to tell that story. Otherwise, you're scrambling, right? You're gonna you're gonna be able to show our listeners how using your system, or at least part of your system anyway, sure, sure. we'll be able to help them do that. 100 percent yes all right and to our listeners before we go too far i don't want anybody to get excited and say hey well wait a minute i'm not using this system this is a sales advertisement no it's not a sales advertisement it's a system that's available for you to use it's a system that i was able to see some demonstrations on when i was in florida last november the bottom line is what i want you to take away from this is Tom will care what system you're using. I really don't care what system you're using. <laughs> as long as you're using a system and you're collecting usable, accurate data that you're up channeling to your states and the states can up channel to the U.S. Fire Administration so everybody can use it to help us going forward. Yep. And, you know, we'll start off with the pre-plans because pre-plans, there's a lot of uh, grumbles and sighs because... It's a lot of work to do a good pre-plan, but not anymore with the tool I'm going to show you. And then it's interesting that even though 57% of departments, and I know I'm throwing some numbers out, but I'd like, again, backing it up with data, right? 57% of departments are using, have digital, some sort of digital, but it's usually PDFs that you've got to find files on a, on a computer or on a server. And 34% are still using three ring binders. I remember in my department, we would have a you know brand new big box Walmart or supermarket strip mall come in, we wouldn't have a pre-plan for months until it landed in the trucks because of the process. And so what we'll show you here is something pretty neat. And, and again, I want to I want to echo too, I am very proud of what First Do has to offer to the, the greater fire service out there. But again, this is going to be very much a solution oriented look at what tool now is available that can really make a difference. And it, it's a tool that is kind of an all-in-one where you're going to see some of the things here that you can manage your entire department and manage it bet with best in breed um, elements. You know, we'll talk about the different parts of the system. And then certainly for the for the audience, chime in with questions, right? Definitely chime in with questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Ed will be here to answer them. Sam's going to keep an eye out on, um, on that. And he can, Sam, interrupt me too as we're going through this. If I miss anything, just say we've got a question here. It's no problem. It makes it more engaging for the uh, for the listeners, and so Sounds it's good. pretty we'll um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And uh, you know, if you're ready, we can kind of jump in if you want. Yeah. Okay. We're ready for you to take Thanks, off. Tom. All right, everybody. I am going to be sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? I can see it. Same. And are you seeing a pre-plan of a supermarket? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Usually it outlines the screen, but hey, as long as you're everybody seeing it, we're in a good spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a lay of the land about what this product can do and then also how it's going to tell your story more effectively. And above all, we always keep in the back of our minds because First Do was formed in 2016 when there was a firefighter fatality in a, in a residential basement fire. Um, uh, uh, there was a basement incident and there was a, a, a loss a line of duty death. And when that happened, it, the, the founders of the company is like, wait a minute, this inf information could have been out there. The assessor's office knew that there was, there was a basement in this property. So 
how can we get that data? How can we bring that into actionable intelligence, right? And the, what you're seeing on the screen here is a combination of data that can be pulled in from outside sources, okay? And I'll go ahead and turn off my camera so you guys can focus, you don't need to see me. And uh, what you're seeing here is a combination of data being pulled from outside sources, but also the effort put in to creating a pre-plan that is usable. And it's not something that you have to do, draw, okay, scan, work in another program, upload somewhere. If I were to go to this property now and have an incident respond there, I can simply edit that pre-plan on the fly when the incident's over, if I notice something different. And so the things here is a supermarket, right? We all have supermarkets in our jurisdiction. And so if we have a response for a person down by the bakery, you know, and again, supermarkets, we go to a lot to get food and, you know, pick up our dinner and pick up food meals for this, for the shift, especially if it's in our first due. But again, you're able to see um, what this particular customer has done. And he's been gracious enough. Um, and I'll do a shout out to him. His name's Roger Parker out at uh, Lafayette, Colorado. And he was also um, fire marshal in Avondale, Arizona. And we've been friends for many years. Uh, and he just does a fantastic job on making this work for his organization, right? You can see the contrast, black on white. It's easy to see in the cab. But when you look at this and what it's able to provide you, even just go looking at the pre-planned map, I can select, okay, we've got a riser here, we've got an FTC, but he's gone so far as to not only is the FTC in this part of the building, but we also have a picture of, it. oh, it's down low with two, two caps sticking out, it's not a Siamese, good to know. Okay, little things like that. All right, now, again, the firefighters, well, great, we've got this wonderful pre-plan, how does it help me? Well, when you're responding, okay, we've got what's called a dashboard. And this dashboard is going to compile the data that has been entered. Again, talking data, but data visualization is huge, right? There's so much, I mean, so much we're trying to digest these days as far as that's coming at us just left and right, including on the job. And so we need to make this usable, interesting, helpful, and supportive of our mission. And so that's exactly what we do. So this is an actual supermarket. I know there's a riser, there's an alarm panel. And if he's put in like here, the electrical shutoffs on the Charlie side, you can put as much or as little in. We have what's called our size up story that you can even play in route, depending on how an account is configured. It can be a lot of information about the property or it can be simple, a couple sentences. Images, attachments brought in. So again, you're able to see that property. And then if you really are managing a significant incident, this might be sufficient for most bread and butter calls. But if you're on a, a longer term, um, multi-operational period incident, something much more complex, you can expand out and see the assessor's office, building department, if there is any information, community connect, this one doesn't have any, I'll show you another one. But again, the data points are gonna be here to supplement the visualization in case you need the deep dive, okay? So you've got that for a supermarket. And then again, any of these properties up here um, where you're seeing, this is our response slider. So these are their most recent incidents. So if I were to go to, um, <clears throat> let's see if I can find one here. You know, we had an inju injury or rollover incident on the freeway. When I click on it, it's going to take me straight away to where that incident took place. And of course, if there's pre-plans involved, I'm gonna be able to see that right away and make, what I hope to be good decisions in keeping my crew and civilians safe. And so you've got that with the pre-plan and the way it's so easy to manage is that if I were to choose to edit a pre-plan, I've got multiple tabs here that if I'm on the scene, I simply make updates as needed or if I'm doing a fresh pre-plan, I can start a, a, brand, a brand new pre-plan here and work my way through where I'm adding what we call our pre-planned units or icons, if there's any hazardous materials involved, contacts, attachments, and those attachments are going to appear on that response dashboard I showed earlier, right? Where you can kind of go through and see the multiple sides of the building or any unique hazards. I can even do layers. And so with layers is if I turn on and off layers, I can see different details based on the incident, or ground level is what you see when you respond to all incidents. But if I need to get into the weeds because we're managing a structure fire here, now I've got a lot more information, access points, 
additional details. And you get to do this based on what your department standards are. You can create your own department standard, right? This is just one example of the versatility of this system in creating some just absolutely amazing pre-plans. And the one thing that to me really makes the difference is that I can make changes on the fly. And as soon as I hit publish, everybody else will see it if they ever respond to this structure or if they're, if they're searching for this address, they'll be able to see that update immediately. So no longer are you redrawing the property, redoing a PDF, redrawing in another program, and then you know uploading it somewhere else and it eventually gets to the latest version for the people that need it the most when they're responding to these properties. Right? So, so Tom, I, I wanna back up just a second. Yeah. At the very beginning, you said you don't have to draw any of this, that you're able to import this from other data sources. So the store that you had up initially, sure. so we're, so the fire department can start with what? A simple Google search so, and they get this aerial view or they pull it from a tax office with, where do they get the original layout for this to be able to build all of the things that are part of this? Great question. So what you've got here is, a Google map or an ArcGIS integration. So you have the map layers to begin with and you either come starting clean, fresh, or you have what's called our automated pre-plans where we're pulling data in from external sources like the assessor's office, whereby you're seeing a lot of these properties pop up based on the data that you have in the uh, assessor's office or the other, re other resources that we are, um, are pulling data from. And so, You've got that ability. Of course, my mouse decides it doesn't want to cooperate now. Thank you, Bluetooth. And so that's one option. Or you simply have, when you have first do, you have the Google Maps and the ArcGIS map integration immediately. So you can start right away and start creating this pre-plan straight away. And again, if you didn't bring in data from an outside source, I could go in and add a brand new occupancy if I wanted to, and then work from there. And one of the nice things too that the system's able to do is your the data that you put in for the pre-plan, so we'll go back up here, the data that you put in for the pre-plan, you also can have primary and secondary properties. So we've got a single structure where we have the master or primary occupancy, and then we've done some secondary occupancies because there's some specifics needed for the secondary um, occupancy, say here in Sprouts, right? So I can go here and I can update this information for that secondary secondary property and make any annotations, make any additional pre-plan units for it. And when I say pre-plan units, those are the little icons you're seeing that identify the features of a building or um, other concerns regarding the building, egress issues, um, you know, hazardous, hazardous locations, hazardous, not just materials, but um, things that could pose an, uh, an unusual risk to the crews. You can document all that right away. So out of the box, you're getting at the bare minimum, the Google map and or the ArcGIS mapping integration, and you can go to town right away creating your pre-plans. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and, and so how self-intuitive is, is, is the system? So, all right, so I, I, I use the system. I put in my home address. I bring up my my house. How intu how self intuitive is the system at being able to to put these layers in and 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 as you're showing here, storage, distribution, so on and so forth. Yeah, hundred percent. Because at the end of the day, part of what my job is as as director of training at First Do is we want to. It's not about us. It's about how are we helping you not only look good in your department, those that are going to be working with first two, but be good, right? Doing things that are really meaningful for your organization. And so the intuitive part of it, the user friendliness, we'll call it, um, is right there. So again, I can do an address here in my, in my community that it should be in this account. Yes. So there's a pre-plan I worked at here in Tucson and I can go straight away. And as soon as I type in that address, I can hit its dashboard or I can go straight away and, and continue editing this pre-plan. Oh, we just went to the Walmart and they moved things around or uh, they added gas pumps to, to this. We can, we can go in there and, and do all of that. And so we're working our way left to right here with these, what I call kind of our, our pre-plan tabs, just sections of the pre-plan that you're managing. Data here is in the general, the pre-plan units, all of the icons that you're seeing um, on the map or in this section. 
the ability to add hazardous materials. And one of the things with hazardous materials is that you're able to, with one click from the dashboard, if I put chlorine in this case or gasoline, you're gonna take, it's gonna take you straight away to the ERG. I'm not in the dashboard right now, but if I were and it was responding, I'd have the ERG at my fingertips with one click. Contacts is here, attachments, which we showed earlier, layers. And so I don't think I have a lot drawn yet, but like if we had an active shooter incident, I could go here and we were just goofing around. But imagine if we had, I don't need to see this every time I respond, but if we had like a hazardous materials release and we know we have an evacuation distance of 600 feet, I can draw that radius and go, okay, we need to make sure we evacuate this area. Or I want my ambulance route for an active shooter to be this path for staging and for egress. Again, these aren't like the most beautiful ones, but it's gonna give you an idea of what that system, uh, what the system can do. And we've got some incredible users of the system that are, are making this work for them in, in a way that's meaningful, right? You can get too cluttered if you're not careful, all right? But they're, they're learning on the need to know information. But at the end of the day, no matter what type of incident you're responding to at a particular occupancy, you're gonna have the data to make good decisions to keep everybody as safe. So as the saying goes, everyone, everyone goes home. And I call it actionable intelligence that saves that saves lives basically. And so you know what you're, as much as you can, you know what you're getting into before you get into it. So that's just, that's just pre-plans, right? And so pre-plans are not a glorious part of the profession. There's a lot of dread. We, uh, we gotta go do, we're assigned all these pre-plans. We gotta go with these pre-plans then. Remember the day where you have the wheel where you measure out the distance so you can draw it accurately into scale. Um, and then note, note all the different, um, ha, you know, where the FDC is, where the electrical shutoffs are. I mean, I didn't even, I go to this Walmart, but when I did this, I just kind of walked around it virtually just to get something done right away. And so there's a dock, so that's a hazard. And put it in, I'm kind of made up where AEDs are. Now you'll see it's kind of layering in where those are at, but when you come around, you can kind of see, okay, there's an AED behind this door. We've got riser if I move a little bit over. And again, I'm on street view here, okay? But you can see there's egress points. So if I move down and look at the building, I've got an egress that means this door. Uh, again, it's not perfect when you're looking at it from the street view, but you can see I've got it here. It's show, I mean, it's showing the other annotations I have back in the structure. But again, you know, I think of this as think of inclement weather days where you need to do some training. Um, you can do a tabletop exercise and no better, no better product to be able to do a tabletop exercise on an incident than this, where you can get down in the street view, talk about where you're going to stage, talk about strategy, talk about tactics. Uh, and, you know, you've got something that you can work with even when you can't get out to the property to, you know, simulate um, an incident in, in the physical world, right? So that's, that's, that's something here that, you know, I know my closest exposure is 132 feet. Um, and again, command posts we're going to set up over here. But again, it's all what each agency will want to do and how they do it. And, and we help you, we help you along the way. So again, it's just kind of the tip of the iceberg on what this can do. There's so many other components here that can be managed. And so again, going back to can, can firefighters and software be, fr be friends? I think they can, especially with something like this, because you see your work and your work is shared with the entire organization. So now it's time to compete with A shift and B shift to see if they can do as good a pre-plan as C shift. And now you've got you know some personal pride here and to put some putting something out there that's going to be very helpful and just a tool like any of our other tools in the fire department, right? It's a tool, right? It's, is it the end all the be all? No, but it's an important part of it. And just like you said earlier, Ed that has become more and more uh, a part of our daily routine. And I think almost all departments get it now, but are, are all departments doing it as well as they could or as well as they want to? And that's, that's the question, right? Um, do they have the tools to be able to do it, right? And so if, you, if you're good, why don't we take a look at a couple other parts of the system and let's see if we have any, any questions. Yeah, the, any questions? So, so uh, so I know, I know one of the concerns of some of the listeners, because I looked at some of the participants, and I know some of them are from Pennsylvania. So I, I, I'm going to ask this question in, in the nicest way I can, okay, without, yeah. without. So obviously, incident reporting in PA is a big thing 
because if you want to get a grant from year to year, you mm -hmm. have to show proof that you've been doing incident reporting. You've been, and, and you can use any software you want to, but Pennsylvania has a contract with a specific contractor right now, et cetera, et cetera. How can they use this system for incident reporting? Let's go there next. That's, okay. a great, that's a great segue. Let's go there next. I think that's awesome. Okay. So again, you can still export to the state. Bottom line, let's just, let me just show you. So it, the proof is right here and for setup quickly, just quickly. So you can see it. All right. Right here. I can enable the NPERS incident export, send it to whoever I want to send it to. And again, I don't want to make, I, I tend to like to make things a training session and I got to be careful with that because I'll get into the weeds here. Bottom line is I'm showing you exactly where that control is, where you can enable your NPERS export. You can defer it upon authorization once a month, and then you add who you want to send it to, i.e. PENFERS, the email address, and then they take it from there. The commissioner's office takes it from there and be able is able to compile the statistics from the from the export. And so, the answer to your question is yes, no problem. Um, that our system is able to submit data as re required for grant programs with PENFERS. So that's that. But then, what does an incident report look like? So let's yeah, take there you go. That. That's that's exactly where I was going. My next question. Let's You're reading my mind. That. So let me go into. Let's go into, I'm just going to go, I like to go into our, our messy, but yet helpful account here. Give me one second and I'm going to pull this one up. That way we've got it. This is our catch all account, but it's got lots of incidents. So you'll be able to kind of see an example of that. All right. Never mind these pre plan annotations because this is all practice here. But here we go incident documentation, fire incident list. And so we've got multiple incidents listed here. I can just go into basically any one of these and take you through a full incident. And so we've organized it in a way that's a little different than what you might be used to. It goes as the kind of flows as an incident would flow. And anybody who's done an Emperor's report, you're going to recognize a lot of these fields. Okay. Now, one of the tricks I do is I hit complete right out of the gate and it's going to tell me, okay, I got to finish. I got to make sure I get all of these fields that are required, get them filled in. And it's going to tell me right away, anything that's read is required that I need to complete. So we work our way through. So you have your sections here. And then within each section, there's a subsection and it auto scrolls to that section. If I click that subsection, excuse me, that subsection. Okay. And so we've got our dispatch information. Excuse me, we have our dispatch information. Okay, and, and again, I am not gonna bore you with all the fields here, but you can kind of get a glimpse of what this looks like, the location of where the incident took place, the resources used on that incident, and also whether A, a was given or received. And one thing for volunteer departments that we have is if you respond to the station and not to the scene, you can document that. And our mobile app even allows you to have a status where you're responding to and arriving at a station versus the incident. And that's especially relevant for volunteer departments where you may respond from home or work and go to the station to pick up an apparatus or stand by at the station. That can be documented here. Now, this data doesn't go out to Enfers because Enfers doesn't care about this, but your department might care about it. And so you're able to document that. The setup on this, this the versatility, the setup here is just, it's amazing. I, we won't, as tempting as it is for me, we're not gonna go into all the setup, but there's so much configurability here that, it's gonna, there's going to be a way you're set this up for your department that's gonna work wonderfully. Size up, okay. So in size up, of course, scene, weather. Now we're bringing in weather through open weather. So based on the address, it's gonna pull in where that, um, the weather at the moment during the, dis, at the time of dispatch, what the weather was like. Um, we right now have it in Celsius, but we're working to make sure we get that in Fahrenheit. So it wasn't 34 degrees this, in the summer. Uh, well, 34 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, it was 34 degrees Fahrenheit when this, incident actually occurred. And so we're able to populate that. And I can tell you from talking with Dr. Lori Mormero, any, any upcoming changes um, to Enfers, one of the things she had mentioned was that weather is going to be part of that, that the, the data set that isn't part of Enfers right now. So we're ahead of the curve with that. And it's kind of cool that there's an automation to it where I don't have to go look it up. It's going to auto-populate. I have the ability to add people involved. And not only am I able to add people involved, but let's say 
we had an EMS patient. So I'm just going to put in real fast so you guys can see something here. Think about your department that maybe you don't report to state NEMSIS, okay, or you don't transport, you don't bill, um, any, any of those elements. Well, we have this, all right? And so let me hit save here. All right, we'll give it a second. If I'm in the right account, yes. So what we have is you, you're probably familiar with the Enfers EMS module. It's pretty simple and it doesn't have a lot of data points, but as an agency, you may want to document things that Enfers doesn't capture, but you don't need a full NEMSIS EPCR. This is nails it, right? And so you've got, again, basic information, but then you get to configure what treatments and procedures your agency provides, okay? Document vital signs, Enfers doesn't capture that. Document med medication information, okay? And again, this is a test account, so you just never know what you're gonna find. Capture signatures for patient refusals, document cardi cardiac arrest information. Again, that's it, and then a narrative. So think about, do I need a full at NEMSIS EPCR? We've got that, okay, we've got that. But we also have this, where you want more than just the basics, because you want to be able to report on this data. How many times have we done innovation this year? How many times have we applied oxygen this year? Uh, all of those things we can capture with what, what I call our Enfers EMS Plus component here. And again, it's, it's taking the Enfers EMS module and kicking it up a few notches, basically. All right, operations. One thing that we also include is some N4s data. You may have heard of the National Fire Operations Reporting System. It's been around quite a while, but we also capture some of those data elements above and beyond N4s as well, and can um, submit to N4s if you desire to submit to N4s. And things that I expect, I would imagine we're going to be seeing this and more in future versions of N4s, things like command established, command transferred, 360 operations, control water on fire, um, you know, fire, fire knockdown, fire out, loss stop, all of the different benchmarks and the additional data points above and beyond what we have here that N4s and some other um, key fields that have heretofore have not been collected but are kind of important, especially on fire incidents, right? We know NEMSIS captures a ton of data when it comes to patient contact, you know, arrive at patient side, transfer patient care, all of those things that, you know, NEMSIS captures. Well, and first someday is going to be capturing some of those things that are even able to tell your story. Why did it take so long to get water on the fire? Well, that hydrant was out of service. Um, we, had to, we, had to, we had to establish a different water supply. And so you'll be able to document that instead of in just narratives, right? Actions taken, we know this. You can document the actions taken not only for the incident, but also on a per apparatus basis and a per person basis, um, which is nice. I also I think of this as if you're doing it well and doing it right, you could look back on your career and see how many times you, you know, did salvage and overall, how many times you, you did fire extinguishment, you know, and different aspects, if you're doing good documentation. And that's part of your instruction at the front end, right? When you're being taught what matters in an incident report, not only is it the software that you're using, but it's also the department standards that go with it. Information, again, classic property details, vehicle information and equipment. And then we go to wrap up, you have full control over narratives. If you have narratives per unit, you can require it per unit or not. And then you can also capture signatures, have them required or not. You can also set it, and this is kind of a pain point I know from, from other vendors is that you can have narratives whereby a commanding officer can go in and edit other narratives, but other firefighters can't edit each other's narratives. And so there's a lot of control here on, on narrative management. And again, it's all set by you, right? You get to configure all of this. I can add images to this incident report. I can, I can um, add attachments to this incident report. And then if I go to complete it, again, it's gonna throw errors here. So we're gonna, I didn't do a full report, but if I close it, right? If I go to print, I can do a standard incident report, full data incident report. And then when I go in there, I have options now. So this has been a pain point for customers. I wanna redact PII or personally identifying information. I wanna include images or not. I wanna redact incident identifiers, just make it for training. And I wanna redact the provider, provider's name. It's authentic, true redaction. So you can have, a, if you have a records request, you can remove the things that, you know, the public doesn't necessarily need to know, uh, especially PII and maybe even providers names, but still deliver 
times and units and narratives and things like that. And so you have control of that. You can directly email it to from here. So just, and then one other thing I should mention is, let me go back and because I'm sure somebody is probably thinking it if they haven't asked it, but when we get into a fire incident, and I don't know if I'm gonna, let's see. Uh, let's, let's go into, there we go. One of the things that is happening is that, say you have an address here, this 342 Linton Avenue. Okay, it's a fire incident. You know on fire incidents, you need pre-incident property value. Hmm, we happen to have that from the assessor's office. We'll grab it from the pre-plan and auto-populate it for you. Okay, now contents may be a little more of a difficult story, but other elements that have been captured in pre-plans, why not have it auto-populate with at least as the, the most accurate as of the time of the pre-plan into your incident report. So there's nobody on the session today that isn't gonna argue that they wanna type more, more keystrokes or more mouse clicks. So more automation of accurate data, everybody's smiling when it comes to that because it makes the report go faster. And then you can certainly adjust it if you need to, if it's something's not accurate, but having that auto population from data that's already in the system coming on into the incident report, I think is just magic. It's just, it just makes my job easier as say, if I were a company officer, chief officer to get that data in there without necessarily guessing like we usually do when it comes to data points like this, right Ed? So that's a good overview of the incident, re the incident reporting module. And so we have time to take questions near the end of this. And so far I've been asking all of them. So I want some of our participants to be ready to ask them, what are some of the other modules that are in your system? Okay, uh, so I see training other... up here. I see pre-planning personnel. Let's do this. Let's talk about personnel because this one is just particularly cool. It's not just the roster. It is a full on scheduling program. All right. And I, I'm going to take you through just some of the key elements dashboard. I can quickly see my profile, any announcements in the, in, that have come through. I see my bank of hours of accumulation and usage of sick, vacation, so forth, when I've taken those. So this table here on the right is the year, see January through December, first day of the month, last day of the month. And you can kind of see Tom's been slacking and he took a lot of time off in January, <laughs> vacation and trades. Okay, so that's that quickly. My shifts, so my shifts will show you your, your schedule but it's gonna show you when you're working is red, when you've taken time off, yellow. And then let's see, if I can go back. When you put in availability, green. So let me show you an example of how this comes into play, right? So that we wanna make this firefighter friendly so that they like using it and trust it. Okay, so we're here on July 20th. I wanna go ahead and put in my availability to work truck 11 and truck two for a full shift on, July 27th. And so what did it say? There was, of course, because I'm doing this, there's another available time registered for this time frame. All right, let's try a different day. We'll try engine 153 that I'm available. Hey, you're not supposed to do this only because these are called demo demons. And so um, when we're trying to show something, let me try one other thing multiple selection. All right, let's try this. So I could go here and I could say done and I can add my time that I'm available. I can request a shift trade or request time off directly from here. What I was trying to do is show you how I could add available time here on the 27th or 28th. And you never know sometimes what happens in demo accounts, but that process is like this. Let's see if it'll give me an error on this one. And so I'm working from eight until seven um, on engine 153, yeah, it's always fun on these. It probably is going to give me an error. Yeah, so it's okay. I want time off. So I'm going to request time off. No problem. The 26th, it automatically takes me to my time off. I'm going to take sick time, put in some notes. I'm going to send my request to my boss, my battalion chief, and now I've submitted that request and he's gonna get a notification that there's someone that has um, requested time off. 
and he can go in, review it. Okay, there's me. Now I can't approve or, or deny my time off, but he can. I can approve or deny his, but the way the system's set up, I can't just approve mine. And so I'm gonna wait for him to approve it. And then what'll, what'll show up here on our shift board is that I will be off on that date when he approves it. So speaking of the shift board, and I know there is a lot, this is a lot to digest the, the staffing, uh, the scheduling program part of our, our system. It's just, it just works really, really well. And so let's say here, and again, this is a messy account. So it's not going to be like a, a realistic account where people are all on the trucks, right? But let's say truck 11, that's spot on, right? James happens to be working um, twice here. Um, and so if I wanted to, and he called off sick that morning, I just bring him over to the time off. He's off sick, but he's gonna be gone just till noon because he's got a doctor's appointment. So we're gonna give him time off till noon. Save. And you'll notice that is overlapping. There's one of the selected reviewers. Okay. So we'll try Jillian. And she's gonna be off until noon. All right, so see how it behaves. It's because he's he doubled up here for some reason. And so here, Jillian, she's going to be off from 12 in, until 8, 0800, but I got a, I've got a vacancy now that I need to fill. All right, and so I've got a couple things I can do here. I can grab somebody that's available like Brandon and say he's going to fill in for her till the morning. Oops, put him in the wrong spot. Safari. It will let well. It will let me put in Safari has a scrolling thing right now. So um, basically, I'm able to put him in, or I can do a what we call manual add somebody. So just add somebody in directly, or what we call an initiate call shift. So what this does is I can initiate. It's a past date because it's today. That's why I should never, never work on the day that I'm working. Let's do this. So here we've got Tori. She's going to take some time off, but not for the full shift. So bear with me. I can't win today. Uh, that's what I get for picking, picking a demo account. All right, Cortland, let's play nice here. All right, and so James is available. So I should be able to pull him in to cover that vacancy. Yeah, it's misbehaving right now. Let me just tell you that. And so um, I, will, I should go into uh, a different account because what, what happens is James will be able to cover here. And if he's available, because he's only available from well, seven to seven for the full shift. So I, he could cover here. And now I've got the shift completely filled. And so for that particular individual, go ahead. So Ed. Tom, a question that popped up is, and, and, and I was thinking of the question myself. So volunteer departments that might be doing duty shifts or duty crews. Yeah, you can, man, you can do that. Very easily do this as well. Use the same. Yes. Uh huh. So here's an account that's a little cleaner, right? So Amber goes off, partial shift. And yes, for volunteers, you can manage it. Again, it is designed primarily for consistent um, re recurring staffing, but it could be used for, st for staffing a volunteer department. Um, and even if you're doing it manually, because there's not a recurring pattern like a shift pattern would be, um, then then you certainly could. Let me show it to you here because now it's going to work the way I want it to work. See, there's Amber. I have okay. two availabilities. It's going to work now. So Rich is going to come in and cover. Yeah, I just, it's making me angry because it's not doing it the way I want. Of course, because we're doing a demonstration, but what normally has happened is I could drag Rich because he's available. He could cover for that eight to 12 and 
If I needed to, I could even add a vacancy if I needed to. And so the drag and drop functionality here allows you to manage your daily staffing very cleanly and very accurately. And when people put in availability, they appear in the scheduling deputy here in the availability section. And then you've got your time off for people that have taken time off, like I have Amber off from eight till 12 for four hours sick leave, okay? And then just to show you, if I, if I didn't have someone that was available, I could initiate a call shift. And what that does, again, on the same day, got to go to the next day. And so here, I can initiate a call shift. And what this is going to do is it's going to automatically send out messages to these people that are in, in an, um, a list, in a, a ranking order that you determine based on hours, based on seniority, uh, based on the last time they worked an overtime shift. And so these people will get a text message or an email or both, okay? And then they can respond. And there's multiple ways to configure the system, but when they respond, the system will treat it, if you do the, what we call our candidate method, the system will then look at, okay, so Tom responded, John responded, and Todd responded. Those were the only ones. Then when we hit the deadline time, the, excuse me, the shift will be awarded to Todd and he'll be notified of it. The others will be notified that the shift is filled and Todd will now appear on the shift board like he should, that he's gonna be, that he's got the shift awarded to him. And so there's a lot of automation here and you get to manage the rankings, you get to manage it all. And then let's say you knew that, well, in case the captain can't respond, I wanna grab an engineer just in case. We can do, it'll do both, all right? A tiered, a, a tiered call shift. So if we get no response from a, from a captain, we can go down to the engineers or we can even filter by, say we had acting captains that were in the engineers group, I can further filter by that as well to show that particular uh, group and have it part of that call shift. And so I've kind of got it covered and hopefully, you know, somebody's gonna respond in one of those two groups. So I apologize okay. for that little hiccup earlier, Boy. but um, yeah. So, we're coming up on just about an hour, Tom. So uh -huh. are, are there other things that you want to show our listeners tonight? I, I mean, I do see how a volunteer department could use this for setting up duty crews, especially if they like a lot of a, a lot of departments are doing like 7 a.m. in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. 100 percent. So because I, I certainly see how it could be done to be able to, 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 to use it to manage volunteer departments and duty crews. Well, and you've got here, you know, this is an eight to eight shift, but you get to create the assignments. You know, we yeah. might have a, and we might even have one in here, you know, we've got a first half. So then work eight prevention works from 7.30 to 17.30. You build this, you build this out the okay. way you, your department operates. Yep. All mm -hmm. right. So to, to answer the question we had from Mr. Timko, the answer is yes, it can be done. Sir, yep, most certainly. All right. So is there anything else you want to show us? Let's just take a quick peek to... before we close, because again, we're, we're, the whole theme here, right, is can firefighters and software be friends? You're welcome, uh, Robert. You're welcome. Um, and so can firefighter and software be friends? And I think you're seeing that the answer is indeed yes. Um, and then one other thing that's a, a daily routine we could get into inspections but what i want to get into is apparatus checks and so in apparatus checks you've got an apparatus and you've got your overview of the vehicle but you can go straight away at a fuel entry at a log entry but you can go ahead and start a an apparatus check right out of the gate and you've got pass fails okay pass but let's say something fails okay now, you'll notice here, and I'll go quick, that, hmm, I want to do a work order, but wait, someone, this has already failed previously. Why? Because I have this icon here, and there's already a pending work order. Now, down here, there's no pending work order. So if I fail the emergency rear lights, it immediately allows me oh my to, heavens. it immediately, hey, Don Brocker, um, thanks, thanks so much, Don, um, Allegheny County. And so... Um, we, it'll automatically prompt you if you configure it this way. Again, the configurability is amazing. 
you're able to say, yeah, I need to create a work order for this so that it can get fixed. And so you work your way through and create that work order and it will show up the next time you do a rig check and you don't have to recreate the wheel each time or like click and do another part of the system. Hey, did they do a work order on this? You're right there in the check list itself and can see, oh good, I don't have to do a work order. It's already been taken care of. So, so, so what, a question that, that I see pop up on some of the discussion boards in various places is, is, is there a way that I can take a handheld with me while I'm doing this inspection and I'm able to do, to do these checks with a handheld that, that I don't have to put it on paper and then give the paper to somebody and somebody with the paper has to put it into the computer. No, you okay. have, this is going to be 100%. And when you say handheld, we're talking like a mobile device, right? Yeah. A mobile device or yeah, this, this works great on a mobile device. You can even access it directly from our responder app. There's one click. It takes you into the apparatus table to go do a check from uh, to go do a check from the mobile device. So yes, it, it can. You can do the check on a mobile device, and many departments okay. do. All right, because one of the things you hear is is that okay, I've done my I've done my rig check, following a piece of paper. Now I got to turn the piece of paper over to a captain who now has to sit in front of a computer and put all that information into a computer. Now, if someone's able to take a handheld, they're doing the inspection, and this stuff's getting updated real time. It's one, it's one and done. Ed. Oh, one and done. Goodness. Okay. All right. James, the answer, um, yeah, to answer James's question, 100% yes. You can, and not only can we import shape files, but also you can actually link to um, Esri, Esri um, layers that are hosted outside of First Do and have it appear in the Esri section, Esri map of first do in lieu of the Google Maps. So 100% yes. Well, I'm glad you saw that question because he's certainly more technical than I could be. The, the word yeah. art map framework <laughs> threw me off right away. Well, and the nice thing there, James, is that you're able, like like you said, if your city has water main a water main layer, you can have that. If they update it, it will automatically display updated because it's linked. We link directly to the actual um, layer. So if that layer is updated, we get, we'll, you'll see it in the arc. ArcGIS map layers in our system. You know, we were goofing around with the Washington DC Metro where they have not only the Metro lines, but also where the where the, where the actual cars are, the, the trains in the Metro DC. And you were seeing it update in near, not 100% real time. There's a few second delay, but you were seeing the cars move on our ArcGIS map. It was crazy. So yes. Mm -hmm. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. See you and I know we're coming up on on the end time. No, we're okay. Was... I'm I'm not I'm not pushing you, Tom. I just there's just so much stuff here that I wanted to make sure we covered several of the modules because I mean I could see how it would be real easy during a demo with this to go down a rabbit hole just on pre-planning and never get to anything else. I mean, I, no. I, the you know, and 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 I've had the opportunity because of my previous career and as a volunteer fire chief to use other incident reporting systems. And I'm not going to speak poorly. They all did their job, but I see stuff here that I just haven't seen any place else before. Uh, that, that, you know, that, well, you and so, me both, <laughs> you and me both there. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's cool. You know what, one thing we talked about earlier, we need to close, let's close strong here with community connect because right. 95, well, what did I say? 95% of departments have no pre-plans on residential structures. Now, this isn't just for residential. The one I'm going to show you is, but it's also for commercial um, data, right? So if you have business owners that want to submit the data, not only can they submit information about their properties, but they can also uh, sign up to anytime an incident gets dispatched to that property, they'll get notified via text message that, yeah, there's an incident going on in my business. Now, we don't have it yet for residences, but let me just show you this example very briefly for everybody that's still with us is that you've got your info that you edit. Okay, so you can edit all these data points here. Okay, your household information. Okay, now what I'm gonna do when I get done here and I'm gonna show you what this data looks like in a response because, oh, this is great. This is what my citizen can enter. And one of the things we have a beautiful, let me see if I can show you guys. So you can see this because it's just really, really nice how they've done it. Uh, let's see. Is that going to be? 
no, I don't want the, I don't want this. That's another one. I don't want the sign-in page. I want to show you the landing page for, oh, here we go. So I clicked the wrong one. There we go. Sorry, I get excited because I think this is so awesome. So we help you build this for your community and you can spread the word to your residents and business owners, message from the chief, how it works with the brief embedded video, what information can be provided, how secure is your data? Because that's one thing nowadays people don't want to share their data because they don't know what's going to be done with it. So we reassure them that this is indeed within first due, stays within first due for the for the purpose of keeping you and the crews that might respond to your um, property safe. And so that's what we've got going on here. That's the landing page that we help you create. So it's very um, specific. You know, this is Martin County, very specific to your your agency. But back here, so before I forget, I'm gonna copy this address because I wanna show you what this information that I've put in here, and I just did it kind of fast, right? So we've got, we've got my info, we've got the household information. And again, I won't, you guys can kind of see the data points. I won't read it, but you can see I got natural gas. So keep an eye on that, basement, okay? We've got contacts, functional needs, mom, 83, deaf, hard of hearing, we got my Greyhound, which you just heard him shake probably. <laughs> and then you've got um, access and utilities. Again, can edit. I'm going quick here, but these are the data points you can put in. Burn permits, you can have burn permits. And what's awesome, awesome, awesome is if you have a smoke alarm program, they can request smoke alarm checks. And in the system, and I'll show it quickly, you can then assign those to companies and they can go out there and take care of Mr. Smith, do a smoke detector replacement, smoke detector check, and they request it through the Community Connect portal. Portal. I can only imagine where we're going to take this in, in the months and years ahead as far as other functionality here, but it's it's pretty amazing. Okay, so that's that, right? What the citizen sees, and it's very simple, easy to use portal for the citizen or for a business owner. And then what does that look like? And there he is again, apologies there. Um, we can go into that address. Let me get the right account. Demo. Go in here. There. And I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to first do. And I can go, I can grab it from my response dashboard. I can put in the address. Dashboard. So there's a, there was a fireworks permit issued. I didn't show that to you. There was a burn permit issued. Contact, those were the two contacts, remember? So again, okay. these two contacts. So they put it in, but when I respond to that property, here's what I see. There has store, fuel storage tanks, sprinkler system, yes. There's mom and there's my pet. So and the property it, owner himself put this information in. They put it in here via Community Connect. We see it here when we respond. So again, <laughs> a residence, right? Oh, okay. dog, the dog's friendly. Don't worry. Oh, that's good to know. When, I, when I'm responding to 123 Warren Street, I see there's pets. Uh-oh, is there going to be trouble for us? Nope, it's a friendly greyhound. Don't Just don't open the door. He'll bolt. Good to know. Oh, and mom's there. So, you know, we've got another residence that, resident that may be, you know, hard of hearing. That we need to need to look out for. These are just some exam, examples, but it's all it, it just shows you directly that that relationship that you're building with the community here, building that trust, knowing that their data that they're putting in is going to be used for the right purposes. And that's really important to convey that if they respond, the crews are going to see things that are actually going to be helpful to them to mitigate the situation or to be better prepared to deliver great customer service. Okay, so I don't see any Q and A's here. But I, I got to ask a couple of questions. So, of course, interface with CAD systems. So, responding times and a lot of the basic information. Is there an interface that that so a lot of the you know, the incident address and time dispatched and the time arrived would automatically fill to the incident report? Hundred percent. I don't know of a CAD. Of a CAD vendor we don't interface with. Okay. So my next question, is there a cost for that? I mean, do, do, do does the, there, the, the- There is, I don't, I don't know truly okay. what it is. Um, and it's all gonna depend, right? If they've already written the first due, 
And there's multiple ways to connect to the CAD. We have like four or five different ways that you can connect data that comes out of the CAD and then parses into first do. There's, there's APIs, there's um, email, okay. you know, XML to XML. There's um, uh, transfer to a, a secure file transfer protocol, SFTP. You know, there's myriad ways that the data okay. can we, we work with you on on what's going to be optimal, right? What's going to be what's okay. going to be the best and most cost effective way to do that. All right. So so here's a question, especially here in in rural parts of the state that in which I live in. OK, so I don't have a good, reliable commute computer connection. So I have all this data. I have the pre-fire plan data and stuff. Is there any way that you can store this, some of this information on a hard drive? So I don't have a computer connection and I go to a, a, an area in my first two area because I live in the sticks and I just, I can't connect to a computer in any way that I can still have access to the pre-fire plan information. So right now it does require internet connectivity, but we are looking at um, ways to have offline access um, okay. for um, for uh, caching the data, progressive web apps, caching the data, but it, because it's software as a service, a connectivity is required. Now you can, our system does allow to do offline inspections with the mobile app. So you can be offline to conduct an inspection right now. Okay. But to, for accessing what you're seeing here, it requires, um, it requires um, a, a connection. A, a connection. But if I understood you right, you're trying to work on a, a solution to that. We've had a lot of requests for some more offline capabilities. And so okay. we're exploring potential, we're exploring potential solutions okay. um, that would allow for at least some semblance of you know, some offline functionality in, in different parts of the system. Okay. So another question I have for you, Tom, is so if, is there a demo? Can I request a demo account that allows any fire department to go, to go in and kick the tires on this for 90 days or whatever? So uh, what, 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 that's a really, really good question. And so what you would do is you would work with your rep and then we could potentially have what's called a sandbox environment. Um, it's kind of a case by case basis that we do that. Um, but it's, it's possible and okay. something that, that um, you would work with your rep to determine. And we okay. would kind of, we kind of take it from there. All right. So, so to our listeners, just so you know, when the email comes out to you tomorrow with thanking you for being here tonight, there'll be links in the email and email addresses you can get to. So if you want need to talk to Tom or get in touch with me, so you find out who your rep is, we can easily make that happen for you. Right, Tom? hundred percent. No, no, no problem at all. Happy, happy right. to connect you. With, uh, however, however you need it or other questions that you need answered, we'll be happy to, uh, to connect you with the right people within first do. All right. I don't see any Q and a in the Q and a box and I don't see anything popping up in the chat. Hey, Ed, it, it's, yeah. it's me. Um, Hey, I just, uh, well, first Tom, thank you so much for this, uh, just wonderful, um, show of, of what first two can do. And it's, it's, I think it's so interesting and, and super cool. Um, it, I do want to mention, it looks like Billy Hadley has his hand up. I, I messaged him individually, but Billy, I'm going to press allow to talk. So if you yeah. um, want to want to say something, you, you can unmute yourself and you can, and you can ask a question. If you press raise hand by accident, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, just as we're wrapping up, if, if you do want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do so. Um, yeah, that's that's all for me. Billy, you got a question? Jimmy might have accidentally raised his hand, but that's okay. And Stephen, you're yeah. welcome. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, you're very, course. you're very welcome. All right, I, he, Billy, if you don't, all right. So wait a minute, something popped up in the Q and A here. What's that? Someone said thanks for the webinar. You're most welcome, Steve. So. One, this final thoughts before we go any further, is there anything else you want to share with us in here, Tom? I mean, I know we're beyond the hour, but hey, I'm not you worried know, about that. I'm not I going think, anywhere tonight except my front porch to set out in the heat and the humidity anyway. No, I think, okay. we're in a, I think, I think it's a lot to look at in a small amount of time, but what I hope I did was, again, coming full circle here in the theme of today's um, presentation was, the value of data, 
but the value of being able to have the data that goes in to be useful. And we didn't even touch on ad hoc reporting and the data extraction, but that's all a part of what, you know, what, what is needed to tell your story. Uh, so we're, we talked a lot about what goes in and the management of it, but then when, what comes out, you have myriad reports. Let me just show you very quickly for each of the modules, you know, from payroll reports to your incident summaries, Okay, response breakdown. Again, this is a very simple report, but a helpful report. So if we want to see, you know, your turnout time compliance, we know about SIPSI and uh, your 90th percentile, all of that. So you've got co compliance reports. And again, I'm just kind of looking at some of our system reports, but we're rapidly going through what's called ad hoc reporting, where you get to create your own reports. And so let's see, I don't even know who's done this one. So we're just gonna see what we get. And so if I run an incident type report, this should give me a summary incident ID and account. This is just not an elegant one, but something where you can see the power of being able to create your own reports by entering the name of the report, the module you're pulling data from, the data source configuration, what you're bringing the data in, the type of report that you want, and again, I'm going so fast here. So let yeah, me just, just yeah. So we want incident reports. We want this coming from incidents. Report type can be tabular or it can be a summary high level report. I get to determine my columns. So what I see in the report, okay. I can have criteria. So I wanna see just 100 series calls. I could go in here and say type incident type is equal to or contains one because we know 100 series calls or one um, uh, starts with, do I have a starts with? Yes, um, begins with is what I want, sorry. So anything that begins with the one, so from 100 to 199, I know there's not 199, but um, that would give me that. And any other variables that I wanna put in here, on my criteria, I'm gonna be able to get that, that report out of the system. And so this is the ease of use for building it and it's gonna be, expanding to all parts of the system. Okay, great. All right, well, Tom, if you wanna quit sharing and turn your camera back on so everybody Absolutely. can see your smiling face from okay. downtown Phoenix, Arizona. By the way, you people in Pennsylvania, it's 110 in Arizona today, but it's a dry heat. It's, we now I have 25% humidity today. Right. It's a it's a dry heat, as they say. Oh, so, my goodness. Tom, I, I want to thank you for a very informative presentation. I'm hopeful our listeners will take advantage of what was shared with them this evening. If you have any questions or need additional resources from today, or you have an idea for a future webinar, please email us at info at providentins.com. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. This presentation has been recorded and will be available at the Provident YouTube page. Please keep watching your email over the next day or so for your certificate. You'll also receive an email from Sam that'll have a lot of links into it uh, and how you can get additional information. And if you wanna be able to get in touch with your account representative, Tom and I will be able to help you with that one way or the other, especially if you're looking to, that you want a demo account set up somehow. So you can go ahead and kick the tires and see if you can break it. Uh, so this wraps up another Provident webinar. Join us in August when Dr. Jen Taylor joins us from Drexel University, where we'll discuss the findings of numerous studies that have been conducted on fire and EMS injuries in line of duty deaths. Until then, stay safe for your family's sake. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, guys. Always an honor.